we're living in a time where what is possible is speeding up at such an accelerating rate that it's going to challenge our sense of stability. One of the things that's changing is the cost of things. We talk a lot about the notion that technology is going to cause us to lose our jobs, lose our income. The most near-term impact from a technological standpoint is autonomous cars, like fully self-driving cars. That's going to happen much faster than people realize. There are many people whose jobs it is to drive. In fact, I think it might be the single largest employer uh, of people is driving in various forms. And so we need to figure out new roles for those people. It will be very disruptive and very quick. Now, I should characterize what I mean by quick. There are over two billion vehicles in the world, approaching, in fact, approaching two and a half billion cars and trucks in, in the world. The total new vehicle production capacity is about 100 million, which makes sense because the life of a car or truck before it's finally scrapped is about 20, 25 years. So the point at which we see full autonomy appear will not be the point at which there is massive societal upheaval because it will take a long time to make enough autonomous vehicles to disrupt employment. So that, that disruption I'm talking about will take place over about 20 years. But still, 20 years is a short period of time to have, I think, something like 12 to 15 percent of the workforce be unemployed. There is a countervailing force that's going on right now at the same time, which is the demonetization of living. I believe we're rapidly moving towards a world where all of these things that we use, that we need to be alive, if you would, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, are very rapidly trending towards zero cost. And it's going to change capitalism in a very fundamental fashion. At the end of the day, in a world in which technologies like the replicator exists... If we had one of these in engineering, we could make all the spare parts we need. The your ability to actually create something and have something where scarcity no longer exists, where everything becomes abundant, changes the whole economic sphere of our world. One of the technologies that is taking us in that direction, of course, is the whole notion of nanotechnology, nanobots. And it's extraordinary to see where it can go in the not too distant future, like in the next 20 years, 30 years at the outmost. If I have a nanobot and I ask it to replicate itself 500 times, and I give you each one of those nanobots, you then have the ability to create anything you literally want that is a function of only three things, the energy, the raw material cost, and the cost of the information. And so we're living in a world where you can have a Ferrari, a mansion, or a literally anything for near zero cost. We are, in effect, heading towards a world where a lot, not all things, but a lot of the ma basic things of life are going to be at near marginal cost. What we're seeing is what I call the six Ds of exponential growth. Everything is becoming dematerialized, demonetized, and democratized. And as we dematerialize things, as things go from hardware to bits, and the marginal cost of those replicating those bits is near zero, we end up in a very interesting world. The demand for electricity will increase dramatically. So currently, in terms of total energy usage in the world, it's about one-third electricity, about one-third transport, about one-third heating. Over time, that will transition to almost predominantly electricity, which means that the demand for electricity will probably triple. Um, so it's going to be very important to think about how do you make so much more electricity. We're living in a world where we have 8,000 times more energy hitting the surface of the Earth from the sun than we consume as a, in a species. And as it turns out, the poorest countries in the world are the sunniest countries in the world. An interesting lineup there that shouldn't be lost on you. And as we look at this, you know, uh, 2016, the year that renewables were cheaper than coal, right? Coal will not ever recover. When I look down over LA, I don't see the farms of photovoltaics or the farms of solar thermals. You see rooftops. And of course, what's interesting is that we're going to turn all of those areas into solar collecting, right? This is a kilometer of solar road deployed in Normandy and Tesla selling its solar rooftops. You saw these numbers, the actual number now that Ramez mentioned at 2.4 cents per kilowatt hour. And of course, to have abundant near free energy, you need storage. Now this is the Gigafactory out near Reno. The fact that 
Elon's prediction that 100 of these gigafactories worldwide give us all the storage we need for a fully electric economy is pretty significant. Let's look at transportation. Uh, at Abundance 360 this year, I spent time with Jeff Holden. His prediction is that we'll have fully autonomous Ubers on the road within two years. This is pilotless, driverless, fully autonomous Ubers. And as part of that, that electric autonomous cars are 10 times cheaper than owning a car. So that's a fast, even if it's just five times cheaper, 10 times cheaper, all of a sudden becomes something that if you own a Maserati, you're going to park your car, you're going to sell your car, you're going to park your car, you're not going to use your car. Because when you have an autonomous electric car that's that much cheaper, that's that much more convenient, it's like you don't use your old, well, most people don't use their old film camera. You put that away and you're using your cell phone. So, interestingly enough, the question is at what point are we going to see electric autonomous cars displace the cars on the road? Because I thought for the longest time, oil and gas was going to be holding on only because gas cars stuck around for decades at a time. But this is a photograph from New York in 1904. And if you look at this, you can spot two cars, two automobiles on the road. By 1917, it was a 100% switchover, right? We went from horse and buggy to automobiles because the value proposition was so much greater. And the question of when that midpoint took place, well, the Model T came out in 1908. Four years later, we, we crossed the midpoint and so it's interesting, and the prediction right now with, you know, uh, with Tesla coming out, with Ford and GM coming out, with uh, Waymo now partnering with Chrysler and with Lyft, is that by 2025, car ownership will be dead. And what I'd like to do is just take a second and look at these different fields to look at how they're being dematerialized and how they're being demonetized. So, of course, in communications and entertainment, we've seen a massive amount. Uh, here are the numbers on communications. By 2020 to 2025, we're going to have the explosion of a number of global networks. We've got Loon through Google. We've got Facebook with drones and satellites. Effectively, what we're doing over the next you know, five to eight years is bringing five billion new consumers online. And they're coming online not like you and I did. Okay, they're going to have connectivity, but they're already going to have these kinds of devices. And at the end of the day, my expectation is they will, and most people will have them for free. Because as the cost of these devices get down to 10 bucks or 20 bucks, unless you have one, I can't sell you anything. So I'm going to give you one of these devices so that you can buy things from me. Or the other thing I might get if I give you one of these devices is I get to collect the data. I get to collect and understand what you want because data is the new gold machine robot is taking over. There will be fewer and fewer jobs that a robot cannot do better. This is a full-size house being 3D printed in 10 hours. Uh, this is Sebastian Thrun's lab. Machine learning, deep learning protocols that can diagnose dermatological conditions better than a dermatologist. And this is uh, just about six months ago when Watson uh, was able to diagnose a patient who had a rare form of leukemia that no physician could diagnose. This is the cost of genome sequencing. You see Moore's Law in white over there, and you see that rapidly falling five times the rate of Moore's Law for genome sequencing. So in 2001, Craig Venter sequenced the human genome for $100 million. And a few months ago, Illumina, the primary company, announced equipment that will be sequencing the human genome for $100 in two hours. Any of you who ever need surgery, you have one question to ask. How many times have you done this surgery last week? That's the number one correlation between the success of a surgeon. If you find a surgeon is doing 10 surgeries per day, that's your woman, right? That's the person that you want. And so when you find a robot operating system that's doing thousands of surgeries per day, and that robot is seeing your innards in, in infrared, uh, in minute detail and is able to do a surgery perfectly because it's seen every variation and the cost of that surgery is the cost of electricity and the capex of that, of that robot, the cost is going to demonetize to near zero again. And I want to be clear that these, these are not uh, things that I think that I wish would happen. These are things, simply things that I think 
probably will happen. If my assessment is correct and they probably will happen, then we need to say, what are we going to do about it? And I think some kind of a universal basic income is going to be necessary. I don't think we're going to have a choice. Universal basic Un income. Universal basic income. I think it's going to be necessary. So it means that unemployed people will be paid across the globe. Yeah. The output of goods and services will be extremely high. Um, so with automation, um, there will, they will come abundance. There will be, uh, almost everything will get very cheap. The harder challenge, much harder challenge, is how do people then have meaning? Like a lot of people, they derive their meaning from their employment. There's going to be uh, psychological impacts to losing my persona of when I ask you what do you do, you tell me your career, you tell me your job. So how do we connect people? So we have to change the story about who you are, what you stand for, what you do. But these are, these are the challenges we have to face. These are the kinds of conversations we talk about. If, if you're not needed, if there's not a need for your labor, how do you, what's the meaning? Do you, do you have meaning? Do you feel useless? These are much, that's a much harder problem to deal with.